Colin really is a wonderful person to have giving the lecture tonight. Why do I say that? Well, partly because he has more letters after his name than I can fit on a small piece of A5 paper. Sir Colin was knighted in 2010. He's been a Fellow of the Royal Society since 2011. He's currently Professor of Material Science at Queen Mary University of London at the moment, having formerly been Professor at Cambridge. He's uh, a Fellow, an Honorary Fellow at at least two colleges in Cambridge. He's been Professor of Experimental Physics at the Royal Institution in London. He's an expert in semiconductors, particularly gallium nitride, in ultra-high temperature materials, superconductors, graphene. He has one of his students here this uh, evening, and he was telling me over our meal about his use of sapphire, because it can withstand such high temperatures, to have the graphene applied to be a sensor used in treating colon cancer. You can see that this was a mealtime conversation to be proud of. Defat, you're very welcome. But I thought that the technology was the sort of thing that was fiction when the Bond films were being made with Sean Connery, and now it's being used in earnest to treat people. So Sir Colin's uh, research and his teaching is going on. He's an expert, unlike me, in the public understanding of science, and as well, in his spare time, he writes papers that are published in Nature on the interaction of the Bible with astronomy. He's written books on the passion story, the dating of the crucifixion, as well as Old Testament miracles. Above me, there is a boss. You may be able to see it on the roof. It's red because this, I think, is the Red Sea. There is a chariot in that Red Sea. You may be able to guess what Bible story this is. Sir Colin has written a book on biblical miracles linked with the Exodus. The chariot in the Red Sea on Norwich Cathedral roof looks suspiciously like a farm cart. I don't know if that's a coincidence or by design. But Sir Colin is going to be talking to us about two miracles. His title, Can Science Fit with Miracles, I think can be neatly answered just by the fact that here we have a scientist who is contributing to our understanding not only of science, but of miracles in the Bible stories. So please give a warm welcome to Sir Colin now as he comes to speak to us. That was a miracle, so <laughs> thank you very much, Patrick. And um, so I'd yes, like to start by thanking Patrick and, and Nick Bruin for organising this superbly. And then thank you all for coming. So I know it's just a very busy time. There's lots happening on television. You know, there may be a new, well, there is a new prime minister and so on. So there's a lot of things to do. So thank you all very much for coming. And uh, I'm going to talk about miracles and really no talk on science and faith is complete without a quotation from Richard Dawkins. So this is what Richard Dawkins has to say about miracles, which he said in an article in Forbes magazine in 1999, the resurrection, even the Old Testament miracles, are all freely used for religious propaganda, and they are very effective with an audience of unsophisticates and children. So if you believe in miracles, you know what you are. Every one of these miracles amounts to a violation of the normal running of the natural world. And um, Wikipedia says something quite similar. A miracle is an event not explicable by natural or scientific laws. And then many years ago, a philosopher called David Hume wrote um, a very well-known article on miracles in which he said a miracle is a transgression of a law of nature. And I think most people in this audience, that would be their view of miracles. It is the usual view of miracles. Um, we're looking at it in a bit more detail in a moment. That a miracle is a transgression of a law of nature. And um, Richard Dawkins says all the miracles in the Old Testament, and particularly the resurrection, are um, transgressions of a law of nature. And therefore, they cannot happen 
because our experience is that you can't break well-established laws of nature. This is a somewhat different view of miracles from St. Augustine, who was a very great Christian scholar. He was a bishop of Hippo, and he said, miracles are not contrary to nature, but only contrary to what we know about nature. So if he was speaking today, I think he would say, miracles are not contrary to science, but only to what we know about science. So what he's saying is, if, we, if, they appear to, if a miracle appears to be contrary to, to science, if we understood science better, we'd find it wasn't contrary. So in the future, when we understand science better, we'll find it's not contrary to science. And Augustine based his belief in his idea of a consistent God. So Christians believe that God was the creator and also day by day upholding the universe. And when he created the universe, he established, as it were, the laws of physics and so on by which the universe operates. And he's a consistent God and therefore he won't break his own rules. And that's quite a powerful uh, theological argument. And um, I put Rowan Williams on here because just to tell you a story, so Rowan Williams, you know, was the ex-Archbishop of Canterbury, and he then became Master of Magdalen College, Cambridge, and I was invited to dinner at Magdalen College, Cambridge, and I was a guest there, and before the dinner, people were drinking sherry and some orange juice, and um, Rowan Williams was masterfully going around the room, talking to the guests, and he approached me, and I thought, what shall I say to him? And I know that Rowan Williams is a prolific writer of books, so I said to him, are you writing a book at the moment? And he said, yes, I am, in his deep voice. And I said, oh, what's your book about? He said, it's about St. Augustine. And so I said, do you know what Augustine said about miracles? He said, yes, I'm very familiar with that. And I then said, do you think the resurrection is consistent with what Augustine said about miracles? And then the gong went for dinner and I will never know the answer because he then, <laughs> so I was saved by the bell. He, he then um, went, went and led, led everybody into dinner. So I, I don't know the, what he would have replied to that. Um, what I meant by physical laws, this is a nice sort of definition of a physical law by Richard Feynman, who was a Nobel Prize winning physicist. And he wrote, there is a rhythm and a pattern between the phenomena of nature which is not apparent to the eye, but only to the eye of analysis. And it is these rhythms and patterns that we call physical laws. So what does he mean when he says, not apparent to the eye, but only to the eye of analysis? So a lot of things which you see with your eye are true, but some things are not true. And a good example is, we apparently see the sun rising in the east every morning, going around the earth, setting in the west, and so we apparently see the sun going around the earth once every 24 hours, and that's what the whole world believed until people like Copernicus and Galileo came along. And they said, oh no, the earth is actually spinning on its axis once every 24 hours, and that's why it appears the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. So what, what Feynman is saying is, when you analyze things mathematically and scientifically, then we find there is a real rhythm and a pattern in nature, and we call these rhythms and patterns physical laws. And physical laws are based upon repeated, reproducible events and experiments. Um, they describe the past, and they raise our expectations of the future. And, uh, I'll just describe uh, a visit I made to... Right, OK, let's... <laughs> I forgot to say next slide, please, so I think we're now ahead of things. Let me... Um, uh, I have my computer here, and what appears on the screen is... Yeah, this is great, thanks. Yeah, just, just, if you just keep this up for a moment, please. Thank you very much. Um, so I made a few additions to my own computer. Um, I'll just, just mention a visit I made to a total solar eclipse in Chile in 2019. And my daughter works in Chile, so that's why I went there. And we thought about making this visit three years before, so scientists predicted on 2nd of July 2019 there'll be a solar eclipse in Chile. And so uh, we made plans to go there, and I bought tickets, and I never doubted that this prediction of science, and eclipse is a fairly accurate sort of uh, phenomena, 
involving the rotation of the you know, moon around the, the, the Earth and the Earth around the sun, I never doubted these predictions would not be true. And so I'd be amazed if this, this eclipse didn't occur. So science can predict the future with some accuracy if we, if we really believe the science, these the scientific laws are correct. Um, so, right. And the next slide, please. Uh, right. I'm catching up. Okay. So I'm going to talk about two miracles this evening. And they're two, two quite important and famous miracles. One is the ancient Israelites crossing the River Jordan. And that occurs at the end of the Exodus story. And we'll describe it in a moment. But, but basically, um, the Israelites have been wandering around in the desert for about 40 years. They wanted to get to their chosen land of Canaan. And the River Jordan was separating them from it. And it was in flood and it was in torrents. And they wanted to get across. And then suddenly, it stopped flowing. And the water stopped flowing. And they were able to get across. So um, that's an Old Testament miracle, which at first sight, I think, sounds unbelievable to lots of people. And then the New Testament miracle, the resurrection, so the most important miracle for Christians. So Paul says, you know, if, if Christ's not risen, then your faith is in vain. So we Christians worship uh, a risen Jesus, and, and, the, resolution, and the resurrection is, is the, the means of getting from the crucifixion to the, to the risen Jesus. So these are two really important biblical miracles. Um, and if they happened in the Bible as described, then are they miracles? And I think probably everyone here, including myself, would say yes they are, because these are just extraordinary events, both of them. And um, they're, they're the events which we call miraculous events. And I'm going to take a scientific approach and a biblical approach to this. So, so as, as Patrick said, I, I'm a scientist. And uh, there's probably a number of scientists here, and you know you sort of, you're a scientist, you sort of eat and breathe science. So when I read the national newspapers, I read it through the eyes of a scientist. When I read the Bible, I read it through the eyes of a scientist. And I'm sure if there are lawyers here, you know, when they read the Bible, they read it through the eyes of a lawyer and so on. And so it's, it's important to me that my scientific faith is consistent, my scientific belief is consistent with my Christian faith, and I find that it is. So I'm going to take a scientific and biblical approach. And we'll also ask the question, are there different types of miracles? So is the crossing of the Jordan miracle a different type of miracle from the resurrection? And um, I'll just mention as an aside, crossing the Jordan and, and the resurrection are, in a sense, linked events. And that's because before Jesus was born, Joseph and Mary were given a number of remarkable signs that he'd be a very important person. So there's a star of Bethlehem, for example, and um, uh, the shepherds came and said, we come to worship this newly born king. And, uh, and Matthew's gospel records that an angel came to Joseph in a dream. So he had this dream in which an angel appeared, and uh, the angel said to Joseph, you are to call this, this person, this new baby who's going to be born, the name Jesus. And Mary also was approached by an angel and said, you ought you to give him the name Jesus. And in, in ancient world, not just ancient Israelites, but Egyptians and Babylonians, names are really important, and they still are in some civilizations today. So the name Jesus was really important. But we have to remember that all their gospels are in Greek, and it's rather unlikely that when Joseph heard this angel in a dream talking to him, he would have heard the angel speaking in New Testament Greek. I mean, Joseph and Mary would have spoken in Hebrew and Aramaic to each other. And so almost certainly they heard the voice of this angel talking to them in Hebrew or Aramaic. And Jesus is the Greek form of Joshua. So almost certainly what they heard was, you will call his name Joshua. Um, and um, yes, next slide, please. And the next. And the next. And the next. Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. Yes, so I, I must remember to look around at the screen. Um, and so you can just imagine that they were told, call this person Joshua. And I'm sure they would immediately have thought of Old Testament Joshua, how Joshua had led the ancient Israelites into a new life and into a new land. And uh, this thought would be in their mind that will Jesus do the same? Will he give people new life? And we believe he does today. 
and we'll enable them, lead them into a new land, and we believe that believers will go to this new land of heaven when they die. So this was something, I think, which then links the crossing the Jordan and the resurrection. Joshua was involved in both of them, uh, the resurrection of Joshua and uh, Joshua crossing the Jordan. So let's now move on to crossing the River Jordan. This was the last miracle of Exodus, in a sense, the climax. And let's ask, has science got anything at all to say about this event? And in particular, does it amount to a violation of the normal running of the natural world? Next slide, please. Yeah, next slide, please. Thank you, that's great. Thank you very much. So, and and the, this crossing of Jordan is described here in just two verses in the Old Testament book of Joshua. And they're very simple, straightforward verses, but they contain a lot of information. So this is what they say. Now the Jordan is in flood all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a, count, at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarathon. While the water flowing down to the Sea of the Araba, that's the name for the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. Well, I don't know what you think of that story, but let's just picture the scene because it's a remarkable story that's being described. Next slide, please. And the River Jordan is not just flowing normally, it says. The, the Bible says the River Jordan was in flood. Probably water coming down in torrents, very, very wide. River Jordan. The Israelites were on one side, they wanted to be on the other side. They could see their promised land of Canaan on the other side. They'd waited about 40 years for this. They could see this promised land. But the situation was hopeless because of this huge water barrier. And suddenly, this raging river stopped. The water stopped flowing. It was as if someone had a huge tap and turned this tap off. And then they crossed this dryish riverbed in triumph. So, next slide, please. If you went outside and uh, started announcing this story in the streets of Norwich, um, then I think many people would say, great fairy tale, wonderful children's story. But can it be true? Can we know what happened 3,000 years ago? Because Joshua, uh, Joshua existed, he existed about 3,000 years ago. And most people, certainly um, people who are not, not believers, uh, but also quite a number of biblical scholars, they believe the story is a legend. So can we throw more light upon it? There's a very odd feature of the story, which you may have noticed when I was reading it through. And a question is, is the account meant to be history, or is it what we call historical fiction? So it's an account which is all dressed up to be history. And the key thing is, what did the writer mean, and what their original audience understood? And there is this very odd, account, very odd detail in this account of crossing the Jordan. So look quickly and see if you can spot it. But this is the odd detail. So next slide, please. Yeah, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Fine, thank you. Um, so this is a curious detail. So as soon as the priest carried the ark, they reached, reached the Jordan, their feet touched the water's edge and then water from upstream stopped flowing. And this is the odd part of the story. It piled up in a heap a great distance away. So the writer is saying this remarkable miracle didn't happen where the Israelites were. It happened somewhere else, not nearby, a great distance away. And to be quite sure of this, he tells people where it happened at a town called Adam, if you don't know where that is, he said, it's in the vicinity of Zarathon. So the writers at pains to point out this miracle happened somewhere else. So I think if this had been a made-up story, the writer would almost certainly have said, as soon as the priest's feet touched the water's edge, the water stopped flowing, it piled up in a heap by their feet. He doesn't say that. He says it piled up a great distance away. How did the writer know this? Well, I suspect people were just as curious then as they are today. And if this story was true, they would have walked across, the water would have stopped, they would have crossed the Jordan, and Joshua would have said to a couple of his men, he would have said, go upstream and see what stopped the water flowing. 
because as far as they can see, the water has stopped flowing. And I think these people have gone upstream and they walked up until they found what has stopped the water flowing and they found it happened at this place called Adam and that's where the water piled up in a heap. And then they came back and they told Joshua and they said, we found out where this miracle happened. It happened in this town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarathon. So that sort of detail, I think, gives the story a ring of truth. And as you will see, there's other things which give it a ring of truth. So the water stopped flowing. Next slide, please. Miles upstream at a town called Adam, or kilometers upstream, a town called Adam. And the question is then, if you're a scientist, but if you're not a scientist, what stopped the water flowing at Adam? And can we find out 3,000 years later? And let's just notice the, next slide please, the uh, attention the writer gives to geography as well as history. So he points to the precise spot where they crossed the Jordan. He said they crossed the Jordan opposite Jericho. Then he points out, as he said, to where the water stopped flowing. He then said, all these are upstream from the Dead Sea, which is correct. So the writer's trying to root the story in, in geography and history. So I think, to my mind, there's no doubt the writer meant this story to be a factual story. Next slide, please. So now can we find a place called Adam where this, this happened, this event? And on modern maps, and I've looked, you'll find no place called Adam. But all is not lost because I, well, it all may be lost, because what happens is our ancient place names rarely survive. Jericho has survived for over 3,000 years. Um, uh, but many place names have just disappeared or they've been changed. Um, in India, uh, where, where my research student is from, uh, there's a place which is called Mumbai, it used to be called Bombay, so you know, place names have been changed. But it hasn't been changed a lot. Mumbai and, Bum Mum Mumbai and Bombay are somewhat similar. And similarly, when ancient names are changed, they often change to similar names. And um, in the Hebrew language, which we're just discussing at dinner, um, the modern Hebrew texts have vowels in, but the original Hebrew texts had no vowels in. It was just consonants. It was a series of consonants. And uh, some other ancient languages were the same. And when you read it, either aloud or in your brain, of course, you need to add vowels but you do that in terms of the context. And uh, most of you will have mobile phones, and the older ones here, probably when they want to write text on a mobile phone, they write T-E-X-T, -T -E -T, but the younger ones will just write T-X-T. -T. You just omit the vowels, right? And uh, then when you read T-X-T -T to someone or read it in your brain, you know from the context it means text, not text or text or text. So you just know where to add the vowel. And so in the original Hebrew, the word Adam was just the continents. The vowels weren't there. So it was the continents D and M. And there was then sometimes a breathing sound. This is this little apostrophe you added before. So it would be now Adam, something like that. Next slide, please. Um, and then when these ancient Hebrew words are replaced by modern Arabic words, and, and Jordan is on the Arabic side of the, uh, the state of Jordan is on the Arabic side of the, uh, of, of the River Jordan, and, and, and it has been with Arabia for a long time. So when Arabic words replace Hebrew words, this breathing sound is usually dropped, and an Arabic ending is added. So we need to now look at a modern map of Jordan, Prasutal town containing the consonants DM. And there is such a place, and it's on the map as Damia, sometimes spelled D-A-M-I-A and sometimes spelled D-A-M-I-Y-A because, again, they wrote names as they, as they sounded. And this is on the east side of the Jordan, and it's 17 miles north of Jericho, so quite a long way away. And I've written here, most scholars agreed that ancient Adam is modern Damia. And in fact, I haven't found a scholar who doesn't agree with this. So I can say all the scholars I've looked at, it's quite a lot, they all say, no doubt, ancient Adam is modern Damia. And uh, the next slide, please, shows you a map, a simplified map of the of, of region. And you see the Great Sea is what we call the Mediterranean Sea. And then if you come inland, here's the Dead Sea, and with Jerusalem uh, on its west, and then Jericho just above that. So the ancient Israelites, in fact, 
they came up in their last journey through Edom, through Moab, and then he crossed the River Jordan opposite Jericho. That's what the story is saying. And then Adam, or Damia, is then, you know, a significant distance to the north of that. So that's the geography of the situation that the book of, um, book of Joshua is describing and that modern maps also describe. And now, next slide, please. Now, here's the science. Here's where we put the science in. So I got interested in this, and I found out that there was a professor at Stanford University in the USA who made a study of what, what was happening in this region and earthquakes in this region called Amos Neur. And I wrote to him, and this is where he wrote to me, and he said, I said, can I use your letter when I give talks? He said, yes, you can. So this is what he wrote to me. He said there was a, an earthquake in 1927, and during this 1927 earthquake, several ground cracks appeared, together with an outpouring of ground water. This soil liquefaction phenomenon has been well observed in earthquakes elsewhere. During the earthquake, mudslides occurred along the Jordan near Damia, about 30 kilometers, that's 18 miles north of Jericho. These temporarily stopped the river's flow. So what he's saying is, in 1927, there was an earthquake, and this earthquake, in fact, was detected around the world. Um, and in this earthquake, uh, there was a mudslide, and the mud slid across the river, and it stopped the river flowing. And, um, uh, and this happened at Damia, ancient Adam, just where the Old Testament said the water stopped. And this is a photograph, not of that event, but of a later event. It's a photograph in 1957 of a mudslide at Darmia, which didn't stop the Jordan flowing, but it almost did, right? So you can see it came very close to it. Hold on, next slide, this is the photograph. So this is the photograph in 1957. And uh, you can see the mudslide, and you can see the river Jordan has diverted around it and continued flowing. So maybe it stopped for a short length of time, but it managed to divert around and flow. Um, but you can imagine a much bigger earthquake. This mudslide would go completely across the river, and then what would have to happen? The water would have to pile up behind it, sufficient to either come over the top of the mud or to divert round. And this typically took one to two days, so plenty of time for the Israelites to cross. Next slide, please. And um, this 1927 occurrence wasn't the most recent occurrence, wasn't what was the most recent occurrence, that there's been plenty of them before. And so there's a number of records of the Jordan stopping in this way. So uh, his letter to me continues, Adam is now Damia, the site of the 1927 mudslides which cut off the flow of the Jordan. Such cutoffs, lasting typically one to two days, have also been recorded in 1906, 1834, 1546, 1534, 1267 and 1160, and then no records have been found before that. Although it's reasonable to suppose that indeed it has been happening periodically because of these earthquakes. And um, he says the stoppage of the Jordan is so typical of earthquakes in this region that little doubt can be left of the reality of such events in Joshua's time. And I should say, um, if you can just remember the map in your mind, it so happens that, you know, we have earthquakes when tectonic plates come together um, and uh, on one side of the Jordan is one tectonic plate and on the other side is another tectonic plate and in between is what's called the Great Rift Valley, which you can see from space. And so the River Jordan uh, and, and, these, and these tectonic plates uh, slide and pull apart. So it's a sliding motion like this and pulling apart as well. Um, and the whole region around Jerusalem everywhere is an earthquake zone because of these tectonic plates which are, which are sliding and, and, and colliding and, and uh, pulling apart. Um, and that's why there are so many earthquakes recorded in the Bible, right? It's because it's an earthquake zone. Um, so that all fits together as well. So uh, next slide, please. So was the crossing a miracle? Well, I believe the evidence is really strong that what happened at the time of Joshua was a natural mechanism, the one which has happened many times since and was described in 1927 in great detail by Amos Neer. Um, so there's an earthquake-induced mudslide, the waters of the Jordan pile up, 
and then it breaks through 100 days, days later. And then we can identify this modern site of the earthquakes called Damia with the ancient name of Adam, which is where the Bible says this miracle, the actual miracle occurred. There's no doubt the Old Testament regards it as a major miracle of God, even though Joshua's um, people he sent out, his, 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 uh, the, the soldiers he sent out, would have seen what had happened, right? They came back and reported. It was a miracle of God because of the timing. Just when they wanted to cross the water's edge, the Israelites were there when this remarkable event occurred. So it was a miracle of timing. Um, so this miracle is consistent with Augustine's views of miracles that this remarkable event doesn't break any physical laws and um, it's just a remarkable miracle of timing and it's inconsistent with what Richard Dawkins and others have said which is all miracles break scientific laws. Um, so next slide please. So it's consistent with Augustine and next slide please. And it's not consistent with Dawkins and Hume etc. And next slide please. So can you so does the Bible anywhere talk about this as being an earthquake? Well this is Psalm 114. When Israel came out of Egypt, the Jordan turned back. So he's referring here to the Jordan stopping. The mountains leapt like rams. When the Bible and other literature uh, talks about mountains leaping and moving, it's actually nearly always referring to an earthquake. When the mountain shakes, the hills like lambs, and then tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord. And I think, you know, we tend to interpret that symbolically, uh, but I think it's meant to be an earthquake. And there's symbolism as well, which is fine, but it's based on this fact, tremble, O earth, is a clear reference, I think, to earthquake happening when Israel came out of Egypt and when the Jordan turned back. So the Bible sees this event and recognizes it as an earthquake. Now, if you go back into ancient times, what you find is that ancient civilizations, not just Israel, but also Egypt, they did not really distinguish between natural and supernatural events. So all events were due to God. So if you go to ancient Egypt, they had many, many gods which were each responsible for different natural events. So it was a god for the sunrise, a god for the sunset, a god for rain, a god for uh, the moon, moon rising, and so on. The, the, the god for the rising of the river Nile. The, the, there were all these different gods, and they realized they were sort of natural events, but they were, you know, the god, god was involved with them, and they didn't distinguish between natural and supernatural events. Um, and so if earth, an earthquake caused the Jordan to stop, they would have regarded it, the ancient Israelites, as just as much the hand of God as if he had, as it were, sent an angel who descended and held the waters back physically. Um, and the miracle was in the timing. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next one, please. Next one, please. Fine, thank you. And the next slide now, please. Um, and if we think of the crossing of the Red Sea, which Patrick referred to as one of these illustrations, um, then this is how this miracle, the crossing of the Red Sea, is described in the book of Exodus. It says, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. So the Bible here is explicit that probably the best known miracle in the Old Testament, and some would say the greatest miracle, if you can say such things, was a natural mechanism. The Bible's totally explicit about this. It was a strong east wind which blew the sea back. And we now understand that in terms of scientific terms, and that is, um, if, well, I won't do this, but this is, a, this is a, a glass almost full of water, and if it was full of water and I blew across the surface of the water, I blew water out from the other side of the glass, it would spill over. So my breath blowing on that water um, would blow the water back. It's my force of my breath on the water. And, um, uh, and so if a wind blows a long time, it forces the water back, um, it gradually forces the water back, and it can force it back a long way. Um, and I think it's Lake Erie in, in, in America, 
um, where a uh, wind blowing along, a, a, along a Lake Erie has caused a height difference of 16 feet. It's a maximum height. It's quite extraordinary. And height differences of five feet are often observed. And then, if the wind blows things back on the, the water back on the sloping shore, shipwrecks are being revealed. It's called wind setdown in scientists. Scientists talk. I've just uh, lost my slides. Let me just try and get it up here. And so wind set down is a, is a known phenomenon. And uh, what happens when the wind stops is that the water rushes back in the form of a bore wave. So I'm just trying to, <laughs> OK, that's fine. Um, no, and so we're not going to talk about the Red Sea crossing except just to say this. So the Red Sea crossing, uh, where the Bible describes the, the wind blowing all night, um, the Israelites cross, Moses puts his hand out of the water again, the wind suddenly stops, all that piled water comes back again as a bore wave. And that travels at something like 50 miles an hour. And if you're on a horse, you get knocked off your horse. So the biblical story is just really consistent with what we know about wind set down uh, and modern instances of wind, wind set down. So next slide, please. So uh, these are miracles of timing. They are miracles because with the Red Sea crossing, just when the Israelites were about to be defeated by Pharaoh's army, then uh, the Red Sea was driven back and they could cross. And uh, just when the Israelites had been there for 40 years trying to cross it by the Jordan's edge, the River Jordan was driven back. This is a really nice um, Old Testament psalm about miracles. It's part of the 77th psalm, but it, it's beautiful poetry as well as describing, I think, factual events. So this is how it starts. You are the God who performs miracles. So the psalmist is saying, I'm going to tell you about miracles. You display your power amongst the people. Your thunder was heard in the whirlwind. So the psalmist doesn't say thunder was heard in the whirlwind. He says your thunder was heard in the whirlwind. Your lightning lit, lit up the world. The earth trembled and quaked. So there you have the earthquakes. Your path led through the sea. Your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. So the psalmist here starts by saying, he's going to talk about miracles, he ends by saying, the hand of Moses and Aaron. So what's in between, uh, you can infer, refers to miracles at the times of Moses and Aaron. And so um, he then has this lovely, uh, lovely phrase, your path led through the sea, though your footprints were not seen. So he's saying that God didn't leave his footprints, as it were, in the muddy bottom of the River Jordan. He didn't leave a celestial visiting card saying, God was here. The psalm is saying it's more subtle than that. God used the natural events, the natural uh, things he had created, um, and he worked through the nature he had created to achieve these remarkable events, which didn't break any physical laws, but happened just at the right time. And, uh, and the Bible clearly regards this as a great miracle, and it was a great miracle of timing. So picture the scene now, next slide please, and next slide please. So some of you may have been to the River Jordan, as I have, and maybe like me, you are very disappointed because the River Jordan is something like this width. I mean, it's really, really narrow. And when I saw it, I thought, you know, why didn't the Israelites just swim across? Not, no problem. Um, but what we're seeing now is not how the Jordan was in the past. And since 1940, large quantities of water have been taken for irrigation of farmland, both by Israel and by Jordan. So that's why the River Jordan now is so narrow. Um, the Book of Joshua tells us the Israelites crossed in the spring. They say on the 10th day of the first month, and the first month of the Jewish religious calendar was in the spring. And that's when the source of the Jordan which is Mount Hermon with snow on that melts in the spring, and so the snow melts, all the water comes from the melted snow, and the river floods. And the next slide, please, is a rare photograph in the 19th century of the River Jordan in flood. So you can see it was a real barrier, right? It wasn't what we see today. It was a real barrier for them to cross, and that's why they couldn't cross it. And next slide, please. 
And there's a, a British expedition in the 19th century which said the Jordan in flood was half a mile wide. And even that's an exaggeration, you know. They meant it to be really wide. So this was a river that the Israelites crossed. And I think after 3,000 years, with some science, we do know how and where this, this crossing occurred. And uh, what I'm saying is not new. It goes back a long way. So Aristotle talked about miracles, and he talked about the, official, the efficient cause of the miracle, which he said was a natural agent, like the wind. The final cause of the miracle, he said, was the will of God. And the miracle was revealed by the extraordinary timing of the event. So this is why is Aristotle. And what's happening is, and, and this is what the Israelites believed, I'm sure, God worked in with and with, in with and through the nature he created uh, and upholds to perform the miracle of crossing the Jordan. And I think we've lost this largely today in our modern civilization. We've lost this idea that God works through natural events, through miracles of timing. And you can ask, how did he do it? And I don't know, but I have a tentative suggestion, and that is, as, jo as Joshua was leading the Israelites towards the River Jordan, he was so in touch with God that he could hear God saying to him, slow people up a bit, you're going too fast, or speed up now. I mean, somehow this wonderful miracle of time was achieved, and I suspect that Joshua was an agent in this, with God sort of controlling the speed at which they may have walked, which you may think is fanciful, but it's a tentative suggestion. And I think, you know, these meetings we find, chance meetings in the street with people, they may not be chance meetings. They may be meetings where God is actually guiding, and we need to be open to this. And uh, so the ancient Israelites, I suggest, can teach us something today about these miracles, which, which still happen, I'm sure, a lot today, these miracles of timing. So this is a conclusion. Some miracles are miracles of timing. God works with the creation he, he created. Next slide, please. Right, thank you. Uh, and God may interact with people to achieve miracles of timing. And uh, I did write a book about miracles of Exodus, and, and I got criticized for saying that I'd explain these miracles away. And I hope I haven't done that. I'm saying they really are miracles, not explained away. But I think um, with the science you can put in, then, then they become even more believable. I'll just tell this story. After writing the book, and I, I was clear to write it as a scientist, so I didn't say I was a believer or what I was. And I got a letter from a Jewish person, an email, who said, I'm a la I was a lapsed Jew, and I left the Jewish faith because I couldn't believe in the miracles. And he said, you've made them believable to me, and I'm now going back to the synagogue. So, you know, I think um, it, it's not explaining my way. So next, uh, yeah. So we can, we can together make miracles of time. I need to just speed up a little. And, and this is a quotation I, I like from uh, the author of Religion and the Rise of Modern Science. He says, the scientist, even when he is a believer, is bound to try as far as possible to reduce miracles to regularities. This is what scientists are trained to do. We reduce um, what the brain does, how electricity works, we, we reduce it to, to, to mechanisms. And uh, so that's what we try to, if you can't do this, then you say, okay, then God is acting in a different way. But the starting point is trying to say, is this something where God is working with and within and through nature? And then he says, the believer, when he's, even when he's a scientist, discovers miracles in the most familiar things. So we really um, must be uh, aware and open to looking at miracles in the most familiar things. So what if a miracle now appears to be a unique event, not like these uh, earthquakes which have happened in the Jordan? And I'm going to talk about the resurrection, and I think uh, you either say with the resurrection that it's an really the most incredible event probably in history, or it's a cruel hoax, and there aren't many other sort of alternatives. And I, I'm not going to speak about the resurrection and the evidence because there's not time, but just to say here's one piece of evidence that Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, um, says he, that Jesus, appeared to over 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living. Now, Paul, we know, wrote this, this letter to Corinthians in about AD 55, 
Uh, the crucifixion was probably in AD 33, so he's writing just 20 years after the resurrection, if the resurrection occurred and you believe in it, and he says that Jesus, after his resurrection, he appeared to 500 of the brothers, most of whom are still living. Okay, and 20 years after they would, so that small detail fits. You know, 500 were living, 20 years after maybe 300 were living. And what, what, is it, what Paul's implying is, you can go and speak to them. I mean, these people, they've seen this great event, they wouldn't be shut in their houses, they've seen, we, we, we witnessed the risen Jesus. And so Paul's saying, you can go and interrogate them, just go and ask them, right? It would take just one of them to say, the whole thing's a cruel hoax. And uh, they didn't do this. So this is one piece of evidence of the resurrection, there are other pieces as well. Um, and so let's have a look at the resurrection. Let's see if the resurrection happened, can science explain the resurrection? So can um, St. Augustine's idea that, that um, is our lack of knowledge, and certainly with our present knowledge we can't explain it, and I don't think we can with future knowledge, and I say that because the resurrection isn't just, I say, isn't just the empty tomb, it's what happens in a whole resurrection story. So Jesus appears to his disciples through locked doors, and, and the, the writers make a point of this, right? The, in a room, the door really is locked, and Jesus comes in. Um, and so that's not a normal body which can do that. Um, and he ascended into the sky, and again, not a normal body can do that. And um, some people say, look, Jesus rose, rose people from the dead like he rose Lazarus from the dead. That is different. When Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead, Lazarus came back with his same body, and he would have suffered diseases and sickness, and he eventually died again. And Jesus and Lazarus couldn't go through locked doors. Jesus um, uh, rose from the dead, and um, we, we're told he then, well, he's alive now, and, um, and, and Jesus also is the first fruits of those who rise from the dead. So the picture of the resurrected Jesus is it's a, it's a glimpse of what our resurrected bodies will be like as well. So there'll be no suffering, no disease, and um, I imagine the ability to, uh, to go through locked doors, as it were. Um, and so I think all these things you can't explain with our present science. I don't think you will be, because there's a new sort of science, I think, which is involved. So I think Augustus, Augustine is wrong about all miracles being not contrary to nature. And so this gives a problem to scientists, because scientists don't like rules broken, and theologians like to think of God as a consistent God who won't break his own laws. I'll just check my watch again. Um, so let me give you an analogy which I, I find quite helpful. Um, consider that uh, there's a piano in this room, and I'm sure there is somewhere, and you hear the piano playing, and you go into the room, and you watch, you stand behind the pianist, and you watch where their hands are touching the keys, and you find this pianist uh, is playing mainly white notes, but every time she goes to play uh, the note F, she plays F sharp. And so if you're a musician, you say, ah, if my music remember is correct, you say, ah, she's playing this piece in the key of G major. Now, what does that mean? It means that when the composer wrote the music, at the front of each line of music, he puts a sharp sign against the note F. And that's the instructions to the pianist that when they play F, they play F sharp rather than F. And uh, now scientists are trying to do that with the universe that we observe. So we look at the universe, we look at these repeated things like playing F sharp, not F, and so we try and compose, we try and get the key signature of the universe, as it were. Um, but now continue watching this pianist, and you'll find maybe every so often they don't play F sharp, they play F. Or they might play A flat or C sharp. And if you're musical, you say, I know what's happening, these are accidentals. And so the composer, has put in these accidentals. But if it's a great composer, it won't be some capricious thing has thrown these in. It will be because it makes better music. And I've tried this, I used to play the piano a lot, and I tried playing a really great piece of piano music with the accidentals and without the accidentals, and it sounds so much better with the accidentals in, so it makes better music. And the composer is free to put in accidentals. He's free to break his own rules because he is the composer, and it makes better music. And so the analogy then is obvious, I think. God is the great composer of the universe, and he is free to 
change things if it makes more sense. And um, if we look at the resurrection and we look at Peter talking about the resurrection on the day of Pentecost, just seven weeks after the crucifixion and resurrection, Peter says, God raised him, that's Jesus from the dead, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. So what Peter is saying is if Jesus really was the son of God, the resurrection was inevitable and not incredible. So the resurrection is consistent with a consistent God who is free to make changes if it makes it even more consistent and makes more sense. So I suggest the resurrection of Jesus actually goes farther than that. It's not just a single accidental. It's like a whole load of accidentals. And when a composer does that, he changes the key signature just for a few bars. He'll have a different change of key signature and then he reverts to the original one. And I think what's happening with Jesus is um, it's like a change of key signature. And uh, let me, maybe. Next slide, please. The trouble is I get very enthusiastic and I forget to say next slide. So next slide, please. Next one, please. No, let's be tentative. This is very tentative. So scientists, scientists proceed by hunches, right? Scientists have intuition. And, and, um, and I think, you know, theologians hopefully do this. But this is, this is a bit of tentative in, intuition. So um, we have our existing bodies. We know they're carbon-based. They're DNA-based. They're certainly subject to disease and death. And the body of Jesus, I suggest, was probably not carbon-based not DNA based, still recognizable, people recognized him, but no more disease and death. And we're told that he was the first fruits of all those who rise from the dead. So when we die, we will be and resurrected, we will be like Jesus. So I suggest that maybe our resurrected bodies will be recognizable, probably not, well, not subject to disease and death, which I think means they cannot be DNA based um, and, and probably not carbon based. So all speculative. And a bit of an analogy with a multiverse, which scientists uh, like to talk about. And the Bible talks about a new heaven and a new earth. So we can think of a new universe with which the resurrected body and our resurrected bodies will be a different form of life with different laws of physics. So they may abide different laws of physics with a different key signature, which we do not yet know. So that's a bit of speculation. I'm now finishing. So what I might suggest is there are actually three types of miracles. The first one I've talked about a lot, miracles of timing. The second one is miracles with an accidental. So let's say the healing miracles of Jesus or walking on the water where Jesus is maybe providing additional force, just counteracting the force of gravity, but just a single accidental as it were. And then the resurrection in a class of its own, so many accidentals, it's a change of key signature and a glimpse maybe into new and different physical laws for the risen Jesus. So, sorry, that's a uh, next one, thank you. And uh, next slide, please. So can science fit with miracles? And the final slide, please, which says yes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Colin. And could we just give a little round of applause for Raymond, who was operating the oh, slides yes. and improvising in the music? Yeah, it was, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Raymond. I'm reminded of that bit when boy bands are singing and they all stand up and the key changes. And we've got to that point. Colin has uh, set the scene. As I mentioned, Nick, our secretary, is retiring and we are hoping that there might be people present who would like to contribute to ongoing Science Faith Norfolk meetings in the future. So just be thinking about that as we think about what questions we might like to ask Colin. We've got an opportunity to put questions to Colin now, but... Uh, can I ask, have you always been religious? Um, by Christian parents. Um, and so uh, I went to Sunday school, then went to church services, uh, although, they, I mean, they didn't insist on this, but I went along with them. 
And then, uh, I guess when I was in the sixth form, I started having some doubts, and I thought I would rethink my Christianity when I got to university. And uh, uh, well, maybe I'll tell you a two-minute story then. So this is, this is a story then. How I so so I um, uh, what I did, I read a gospel, and I also read another book about Christianity, um, and. Uh, I decided, like many people think, that either Jesus was mad, you know, really deranged, or um, he was a, a swindler, a great hoaxer, or else he was who he said he was. And I, actually, I found that not an easy decision to make, in fact, what, what, what he was. Um, but then I decided um, it was true. Um, but I also decided I was having such a great time at university uh, I didn't want Christianity just now. I was going to put it off, right, until, <laughs> until I was older and then come back to it. And um, it so happened that um, I was in, I was at Imperial College in London, and um, I was in a house in Chiswick for accommodation, and two other people were in the house for accommodation, and uh, by chance, maybe in quotes, they were both Christians, and so they went to church every Sunday, and I went along with them, uh, mainly because the girls were quite good looking in the church. I, you know, I thought I'd keep going there. Um, and, and I just pretended to be a Christian, uh, but I knew I wasn't because I put it, make it to the, made this decision to put it off till later. And um, then after church service, the minister would have us round to his house and we'd have a discussion group and then we'd all go back home. And uh, so this group of us, uh, and there's a bigger group than just people in my house, the three in the house I was staying in, um, we were walking home one night and um, someone I didn't know turned to me and he said, Colin, he said, um, you're a Christian and I want to become a Christian. Can you tell me how? And I thought, what do I say? Do I say I decided not to be a Christian, which would sort of, you know, ruin maybe his search for faith? Or do I say I'm a Christian and I sort of knew how to tell him to become a Christian, but I thought it won't have any conviction. And so I sort of chickened out and I said, uh, look, I think you better go and see the minister you know, the next day, which probably was a good, good idea anyway. And so um, I went home that evening and thought, you know, I just couldn't sit on the fence like this. I, had to, I couldn't put off this decision. So, so I became a Christian that evening as well because of this person's thought. And he actually became a Christian when he went, went to see the minister. So it all worked out well in the end, as it were. But that, that's my rather curious story of how I became a Christian. So I brought up a Christian household and I really tried to rethink the whole thing again myself when I was at university, and I came through. Thank you. Glad the vicar got a look in there, or the minister. A uh, question at the back. No. Colin, I'm afraid you lost me a little bit on the resurrection. Were you saying that Christ in the resurrected form had no DNA? In which case, was he a figment of the imagination of people who saw him? Right. I'm sorry to be so stupid, but yes, um, yes. I'm lost on that. Yes, yes. No, thank you. Now, that, that, is, that is a very good question. So, um, what, I'm, and what I was saying was, was, was partly speculative, and I said that. I, I'm saying that Christ's resurrection body seemed to have been different from his body before his resurrection. Um, he was recognizable, although perhaps not instantly so. So Mary in the garden thought he was the gardener, and then when he spoke, you know, he reckoned, she recognized him. The people on the road to Emmaus didn't instantly recognize him, although they were sort of disciples. So, so he was definitely recognizable. Um, but um, our bodies cannot go through uh, locked doors. Um, our bodies, I think, couldn't go through the terrible scourgings of the crucifixion and so on, and then, uh, you know, three days later rise again. Um, so there was something different about his resurrected body. Um, and his resurrected body wouldn't suffer decay and death. And, you know, we know with, um, I don't know for biology, but other people know this, we, we know that uh, death is really inbuilt into us. Right? I mean, DNA controls um, 
many of our bodily functions and everything, but, but death is inbuilt into our bodies. In our resurrected body, death will not be inbuilt into that. So I'm just saying, as a scientist, very tentatively, I think our resurrected bodies will of necessity have to be fundamentally different from our existing bodies because we won't suffer and we won't have death anymore. So that's, my, uh, that's what I was trying to get through, that uh, maybe we will not be DNA-based in the way we are now, but we will not be spirits. We'll have a bodily form, so we will recognize each other. So it's something I think we can just gra grasp but straws, as it were, um, but just look at Jesus' resurrected body and say people recognized him um, and he could have friendship with people, obviously, um, but his body had powers which uh, his previous body did not have. A good question. I think, I think there may be a supplementary coming. I'm afraid there is a supplementary coming. Yes. Um, if you believe, as I do, that God and Jesus exist in the good you see in other people, in other words, they are inanimate, then Mary, when she sees the gardener, is actually seeing the good in that person, seeing Christ in that person, in the road to Emmaus. The, the um, disciples see what they think is Jesus. But in fact, I believe that what they saw was Jesus in that person. In other words, mm -hmm. that God, Jesus, exists as the good that exists in everybody, mm -hmm. perhaps in Christ to an infinite extent compared to the rest of us. Mm -hmm. But um, it seems to be another way of looking at it, which avoids the DNA problem. Take that Thank as a question. You. Do you want to comment? comment? Oh, yes. <laughs> sort of question. Mm -hmm. Do you want to comment further? I'll, I'll, quick, well, I'll comment, and maybe you could comment as well if you would like to. But, but oh, no, I'll leave, yeah. no, so, oh, let me comment first. So, no, thank you very much. So I think... Um, uh, I mean, Jesus is responsible for the good in a lot of people. I, I, I agree with you there. Um, but I think, uh, I think you're saying basically that Jesus actually wasn't himself resurrected, so he died and that was it. Is that correct, what you're... Um, yes. Yes, sort yes. of, right. Yeah. I, I cannot believe he died and then suddenly came alive again. Right. But I think that his spirit was mm -hmm. left, and that exists in everybody mm -hmm. to a more larger or lesser extent. Mm -hmm. And it is that that you see. And when you see somebody, every now and again, you see Christ in that person, mm -hmm. because they are quite obviously good at that particular instant mm -hmm. in time. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so, so I would say that uh, I agree with you that you do see Jesus in, in certain people, and, and, and certain people remarkably you see Jesus in. But I would say, that um, the biblical story has an empty tomb where, you know, the Mary and then the disciples, the women first, and, and interestingly, the women first, and then the disciples uh, saw the empty tomb. And um, the other thing is that, I mean, after the crucifixion, uh, the disciples were, were terrified people. That's why they were in a locked room. And then something transformed them, and that is consistent with them seeing the risen Jesus. So uh, I, I think we, we just disagree on that. I would say that there is, you know, this evidence that Jesus really did rise from the dead. And uh, uh, it was this resurrected Jesus that people saw. And when the 500 people saw the resurrected Jesus, um, you know, they weren't seeing someone who was just a good man, but it really was a resurrected Jesus. Yeah, I mean, Colin very kindly suggested I could come in. <laughs> And obviously it's a huge subject and our background understanding of the world is going to affect how we interpret the evidence. But as I understand it, critical scholars are agreed to over 90% of those who published on it that the disciples had experiences that they took to be the risen Jesus. And as Colin was uh, alluding to, even in the earliest list of witnesses that, co that First Corinthians list in St. Paul's letter to Corinth, he is appealing to group experiences and that's significant because if it's just in your mind others won't share 
that experience. So the fact that St. Paul appeals to appearances to groups suggests that it was some sort of objective uh, cause that explained why they all were having that experience. But obviously it's a huge subject. Uh, one of the classic books on this is Tom Wright's The Resurrection of the Son of God. And, and he also points out how the stories in the Gospels seem to be torn between describing something that sounds like a ghost appearing through locked doors, but on the other hand, they're insistent he isn't a ghost. So they're reporting embarrassing features like that he's hard to recognize alongside their insistence. So it's going against their bias. And this is a sign of uh, a witness who is reporting something objective and not just making up a story to illustrate a nice religious parable. But it's a huge subject and people are going to disagree and we're not going to settle it tonight, I suspect. Uh, so we have a question at the front. Peter's in house, so Peter will come to you. But Yes, I would ask that what the meaning of sacred is for science, because I think that the human mind, the analytical mind, can only go to a certain point. Uh, beyond that, you can, in space, be in inner space, without thinking, come into that sacred space where there is a different understanding which doesn't pass through the mind. Right, so, no, thank you. So, so um, Rurik, your question is, what, what is sacred to a scientist? Is that, yes, yeah. So I think, um, I mean, scientists are a huge range of people like other people, and so I think for some scientists, there's probably very little which is sacred. I think for other scientists, they would say that listening to a really great piece of music uh, it puts them into a you know sacred state, a sacred frame of mind, um, or looking at some perhaps wonderful painting or some wonderful piece of nature is sacred to them. Um, I would say that the experience of God that um, many people have is a different sort of sacred experience to listening to a wonderful piece of music, although that can enhance the sacred experience and. Um, so, um, but I would say that as regards the sacred, scientists are much like other people, except they are probably more reductionist and more materialistic in that sense than, than, than many other people. And that's a right, an incomplete answer, but I hope it uh, makes some sense. Mm. One might hope that they hope hold the truth sacred. And in that spirit, I saw Peter Richmond. <laughs> Thank you for a, a very interesting talk. I wish I was studying physics at Queen Mary College now rather than 50 years ago. <laughs> but uh, the question I have is, can you say when the last sighting of Jesus was? Most of these sightings were obviously around the period he lived. But when was the last sighting of the physical Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, mm. when was that dated? I mean, I'm not aware of him today, for example. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I would guess the last sighting of the resurrected Jesus was at the Ascension on the Mount of Olives, I would guess. I mean, Paul claimed to have had a vision of the risen Jesus, which isn't quite the same thing. Um, that would be, I would have thought that the ascension was the, you know, when the disciples were on the Mount of Olives and uh, they saw Jesus rising up again uh, with a different sort of body defying gravity, as it were, um, <coughs> is the last sighting. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, again, I'm going to just come in because Colin's please. been so kind. Uh, Peter, when we have St. Paul listing those appearances in 1 Corinthians, he puts his own appearance at the end and says, as to one untimely born, and I understand the Greek word is used of an abortion. So there's something very unusual about St. Paul's appearance, though he is insistent that he is an apostle. But we also have appearances to John of the Revelation in the, the last book of the Bible. He describes these as visions that he's seeing Jesus. 
and I'm very pleased uh, that my, I'm not allowed to mention my family, but someone known to me has just got into Keyes College, where my mother failed to get into. She was interviewed by Hugh Montefiore, who went on to become Bishop of Birmingham. He was Jewish, but he had an appearance of Christ in the room with him, which converted him. Now, that those appearances don't seem to be quite like the ones that St. Paul lists and in the Gospels. But as I understand it, there are people who have some sort of apparition and vision of Jesus you know, to this day, but they're not quite of the same order as the ones that we have. Uh, so difficult, isn't it? <laughs> have we got any other? I believe I'm writing saying that in the Muslim faith, uh, they allege that, that Christ didn't die on the cross, but that he was saved by God. Is it possible, do you think, that when Christ was taken down from the cross, he was actually in a comatose state? Some people's reaction to uh, extreme uh, trauma is to go into a very low level of bodily activity possibly even as, uh, uh, allowing for the water and blood to pour from his pierced body. Could it have been then that he was in such a state and that when he was uh, laid in the tomb in a, a, a quieter, much cooler environment, he eventually revived? Hmm. Right, yes, well, thank you very much. Um, I think... It is what you say. Um, I think it's unlikely because first I think the Roman soldiers would know a dead person crucified when they saw one. I mean, there was just rather large numbers of crucifixions in, 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 in Roman, and, and, and in Rome, but, 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 but in the Roman Empire, but in, in Jerusalem. Um, and we know that from historical records. So I think they'd know a dead person when they saw one. I think you mentioned the water and the blood. So um, there's this uh, rather interesting statement that, that, that um, to see if Jesus, I mean it's a test they did to see if Jesus was dead, a Roman soldier pierced his side um, and out flowed water and blood. So this suggests that the, he'd been dead for sufficiently long that the water and the blood had sort of separated, so they came out separate, which I think is a pretty good sign of death. And then the other thing is that if what you said is correct, then when Jesus rose again from his comatose state, he would have been in the same body as he had before, whereas I say the evidence from resurrection is from a, diff a, a, a physically different body, although a recognizable body. So, you know, in a sense, physically the same. His out physical outline and everything was the same, and he talked with the same voice, but there was something different about his, his resurrected body because he could go through locked doors and so on. Um, so I think the, the, evidence of the, the evidence of the resurrection, I think, is, is stronger than the evidence for saying he went into some comatose state. But thank you, it's a good question. Yeah, I can't resist adding that one of the reasons why this swoon theory went out of fashion with critical scholars is if you think about it, what was Jesus thinking about his survival, persuading his disciples that he had been raised from the dead and conquered death? Would he really have felt that if he had swooned and recovered? And also, would the disciples have encountered this person who'd had a brush with death and said, oh, I can't wait until I get my resurrected body, seeing what was before them. So that, that theory has gone out of favor. And even a lot of Muslim apologists I've heard on the internet, I've been talking about my YouTube experiences, but they are exploring other understandings of the verse in the Quran, not least because as well as Jesus becoming a deceiver if he's just survived death, and persuades everyone who's resurrected. It makes Allah a deceiver if he has done that. And the Christians go on to become the dominant faith. And they've done so on the basis of a lie that Allah has propagated. And that's theologically difficult too. So I, ho I hope I'm helping. And, and are there people bursting to ask questions? Do you, do you want a supplementary, Colin? Oh, but quick one, yes. Very quick, quick one. Um, I am a believer. Mm. Despite what I've said, to me, being possible, it's still, for me, a resurrection. It doesn't do anything to detract from Christ's message. Mm. Uh, when you talked about um, the Roman soldiers who would have known he was dead, 
I'm, we're talking about expectation. I would have expected him to be dead. Also, if some people at first didn't recognise who they were talking to after he'd risen, they'd expected him to be dead. So they wouldn't immediately connect what they were seeing with the previous person, if you see what I mean. Yes, I do, yes. Um, yes. Yeah. To me, it, it, it ties in. Mm. And as I said, I'm a believer. I'm yes. not detracting from yeah. it. Yes, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I yeah. fully, ex yeah. in fact, yes. I have experienced yes. 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 something else. Yes. So I, I do know. Yeah. Yes. I do believe. Yeah. No, look, I, look, I think you make a very good point. I think you know, the point you're making is um, when, um, when Mary was in the garden of, of Gethsemane, right, and, and, uh, and Jesus was there, she, she thought he was a gardener. And I think you make a very good point. She was not expecting Jesus. And it's when he, she heard his voice, you know, which was very distinctive, she'd heard many times, that she realised it was Jesus. So I think that's a good point you make. I agree with you. Yes, yeah. And I'm glad you're a believer as well. That's good. Yes. Amen to that. I think there was just a finger. Yeah. And, and this will be the last one. Um, sorry, I just wanted to just clarify something you were saying about the miracles. So um, I can see the miracles you chose, the, the Jordan and the Red Sea. They were miracles of timing and they were consistent with science. I was just thinking about miracles like Moses where the staff turned into a snake or the widow where the oil never ran out. Those presumably are not consistent with science and is that what you would call accidentals? Is that what you meant by accidentals? Yes, I didn't quite catch you. You talked about the uh, oil not running out and what was the other one? The... Moses and the staff that turned into a snake. Right, right. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Right, no, no, good question. So, so um, yes, in the Exodus, there's this story about um, uh, Moses' staff, which turned into a snake. Um, what's interesting about that story is that um, the Pharaoh had his own, you know, wise men, and they could do the same thing. Um, now, I've wanted to go to Morocco because I am told <laughs> that people can do the same thing there. So there's a certain um, uh, way that you, you can f feed some, some drug to snakes and they just go rigid and then, you know, or you can, you can effectively hit and hypnotize. I don't know if that's true, but I'm told that's the case. Um, so I would say, and with the oil which doesn't run out, that's, that is quite difficult to have a scientific explanation of. So I would say that is then... Um, so I would say you should first of all see if God is working through the, the in and through nature. That's a normal way he operates. If that is not feasible, then I would say God is doing something special. And so I would say the oil doesn't run out. It's probably something special. So I'd agree with you. So thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, brilliant questions, everyone. And as I pre predicted and prophesied. We haven't converted everybody on the spot, but uh, Colin, you've done a marvellous job and interacted with science and uh, with the scriptures and uh, with our audience. So if we can give Colin a final round of applause, please. <laughs> And you have stayed on so long, everyone. I do hope and pray that you've enjoyed it, uh, that you might be able to make a donation. The cathedral doesn't keep itself up, doesn't maintain itself, and doesn't have uh, stewards by magic. Uh, so all of these are opportunities for us to show our gratitude in the time-honored fashion of making a retiring collection. Uh, Colin, I think because of the time, we'll be around a bit longer if you would like to interact afterwards. But uh, please do go home safely. Please do contribute to the retiring collections on the way out if you can. And Nick, if you wave, Nick Bruin, <laughs> he deserves a lot of praise, but also would be willing and interested in having anybody give their name to go on our mailing list. And particularly if you're interested uh, in doing live meetings of Science Faith Norfolk and helping with the organization, then please do let Nick know or let us know through our website uh, by email afterwards if you've thought or prayed about it and think you might help. So good night, God bless, and thank you very much, everyone. Bye, thank you.